Bowl of bays, said Hermione. Bless you, said Ron. It's French, said Hermione. I had it on the holiday summer before last. It's very nice. I'll take you... I'll take your word for it, said Ron, helping himself to black pudding. The great hall seemed somehow much more crowded than usual, even though there were barely twenty additional students there. Perhaps it was because their differently coloured uniforms stood out so clearly against the black of the hall court's robes. Now that they had removed their furs, the dumb strang students were revealed to be wearing robes of deep blood red. Hagrid sidled into the hall through a door behind the staff table, twenty minutes after the start of the feast. He slid into his seat at the end and waved at Harry. Ron and Hermione with Harry, Ron and Hermione, with a very heavily bandaged hand. Scrooge doing all right, Hagrid, Harry called. Thriving, Hagrid said, called back happily. Yep. I'll just bet they are, said Ron quietly. Looks like they're they finally found a food that they like, doesn't it? Hagrid's fingers. At that moment, a voice said, Excuse me, are you wanting the bolobes? It was the girl from Bobaxton who had laughed during Dumbledore's speech. She had finally removed her muffler. A long sheet of silvery blonde hair fell almost to her waist. She had large, deep blue eyes and very white, even teeth. Ron went purple. He star stared up at her, opened his mouth to reply, but nothing came out except a faint gurgling noise. Yeah, have it, said Harry, pushing the dish towards the girl. You have finished with it. Yep, said Ron. Ron said breathlessly. Yep, it was excellent. The girl picked up the dish and carried it carefully off to the Ravenclaw table. Ron was still goggling at the girl as though he had never seen one before. Harry started to laugh. The sound seemed to jog Ron back to his senses. She's a Vila, said Ron hoarsely to Harry. Of course she isn't, said Hermione tartly. I don't see anyone else gaping at her like an idiot. But she wasn't entirely right about that. As the girl crossed the hall, many boys' heads turned, and some of them seemed to have become temporarily speechless, just like Ron. I'm telling you... That's not a normal girl, said Ron, leaning sideways so he could keep a close, a clear view of her. They don't make them like that at Hogwarts. They make them okay at Hogwarts, said Harry, without thinking. Cho Chang happened to be sitting only a few places away from the girl with the silver hair, silvery hair. When you've both put your eyes back in your heads, said Hermione briskly, You'll be able to see who's just arrived. She was pointing up at the staff table. The two remaining empty seats had just been filled. Ludo Bagman was now sitting on Professor Karkaroff's other side, while Mr. Crouch, Percy's boss, was next to Madame Maxine. What are they doing here? said Harry in surprise. They organized the tri the Triwizard Tournament, didn't they? said Hermione. I suppose they want to be here to see it start. When she when the second course arrived, they noticed a number of unfamiliar puddings, too. Ron examined an odd sort of pale blanc mange closely, then moved it carefully a few inches to his right so that it would be clearly visible from the Ravenclaw table. The girl who looked like a Vila appeared to have eaten enough, however, and did not come over to get to get it. Once the golden plates had been wiped clean, Dumbledore stood up again. A pleasant sort of tension seemed to fill the hall, the hall now. Harry felt a slight thrill of excitement, wondering what was coming. Several seats along from them, Fred and George were leaning forward, staring at Dumbledore with great concentration. The moment has come, said Dumbledore, smiling around at the sea of, of upturned faces. The Triwizarding Tournament is about to start. I would like to say a few words of explanation before we bring in the casket. The what? Harry muttered. Ron shrugged. Just to clarify the procedure which we will be following this year. But firstly, let me introduce, for those who do not know them, Mr. Bartimus Crouch, Head of the Department of International Magical Cooperation, 
There was a smattering of polite applause, and Mr. Ludo Bagman, head of the Department of Magical Games and Sports. There was a much louder round of applause for Bagman than for Crouch, perhaps because his fame, as because of his fame as a beater, or simply because he looked so much more likable. He acknowledged it with a jovial wave of his hand. Bartimus Crouch did not smile or ev- or wave when his name had been announced. Remembering him in the, the neat suit at the Quidditch World Cup, Harry thought he looked strange in wizard clo- wizard's robes. His toothbrush moustache and severe parting looked very odd next to Dumbledore's long white hair and beard. Mr. Bagman and Mr. Crouch have worked tirelessly over the past last few months on the arrangements for the Tri-Wizarding Tournament, Dumbledore continued, and they will be joining myself, Professor Kokoroff, and Madame Maxime on the panel, which will judge the champion's efforts. At the mention of the word champions, the attentiveness of the listening students seemed to sharpen. Perhaps Dumbledore had noticed the sudden stillness, for he smiled and said, as he said, "'The casket, then, if you please, Mr. Filch,' Filch, who had been lurking unnoticed in the far corner of the hall, now approached Dumbledore, carrying a great wooden chest, encrusted with jewels. It looked extremely old. A murmur of excitement, excited interest, rose from the watching students. Dennis Creevy actually stood on his chair to see it properly, but, being so tiny, his head hardly rose above anyone else's. The introduction... The introduction... No, sorry. The instructions... For the tasks the champions will face this year have already been examined by Mr. Crouch and Mr. Bagman, said Dumbledore, as Filch placed the chest carefully on the table before him, and they have made the necessary arrangements for each challenge. There will be three tasks spaced throughout the school year, and they will test the champions in many different ways. Their magical prowess, their daring, the powers of deduction, and, of course, their ability to cope with danger. At this word, the hall was filled with a silence so absolute that nobody seemed to be breathing. As you know, three champions compete in the tournament. Dumbledore went on calmly, one from each of the participating schools. They will be marked on how well they perform each of the tournament tasks, and the champion will be with the highest total after task three will win the Triwizarding Cup. The champions will be chosen by an impartial selector, the Goblet of Fire. Dumbledore now took out his wand and tapped three times upon the top of the casket. The lid creaked slowly open. Dumbledore reached inside and pulled out a large, roughly hewn wooden cup. It would have been entirely unremarkable had it not been full to the brim with dancing blue-white flames. Dumbledore closed the casket and placed the the goblet carefully on top of it, where it would be clearly visible to everyone in the hall. Anybody Anybody wishing to submit themselves as champion must write their name and school clearly upon a slip of parchment and drop it into the goblet of fire, said Dumbledore. Aspiring champions have twenty-four hours in which to put their names forward. Tomorrow night, Halloween, the goblet will return the names of the three it has judged most worthy to represent their schools. The goblet will be placed in the entrance hall tonight, where it will be freely accessible to all who wish to compete. To ensure that no underage students Um, "'Yield to the temptation,' said Dumbledore. "'I will be drawing an age line around the Goblet of Fire "'once it has been placed in the entrance hall. "'Nobody under the age of seventeen will be able to cross this line. "'Finally, I wish to impress upon any of you wish- wishing to compete in this tournament "'that this tournament is not to be entered into lightly. "'Once a champion has been selected by the Goblet of Fire, "'he or she is obliged to see the tournament through to the end.' The placing of your name in the goblet constitutes a binding magical contract. There can be no change of heart once it has, be- once you have become champion. Please be very sure, therefore, that you are wholeheartedly prepared to play.